Hello, good evening. Welcome to this first in the series of the RPS Awards Talks. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Joe McDonald, who will start this evening's talk off. Welcome to tonight's conversation with Lola Flash and Rachel Sai. This is the first in a series of conversations arranged in partnership with Autograph, the London-based international non-profit photographic arts charity with a remit in photography and film, addressing cultural identity, race representation and human rights. Working at the forefront of gender queer visual politics for more than three decades, Photographer Lola Flash's work challenges stereotypes and gender, sexual and racial preconceptions. Lola's art and activism are profoundly connected, connected fueling a lifelong commitment to visibility and preserving the legacy of LGBTQIA and communities of color worldwide. Lola was awarded an honorary fellowship of the society in 2021. Renee Musai is Senior Curator and Head of Curatorial and Collections at Autograph, a curator, writer and scholar with a particular interest in African and diasporic lens-based practices. She has organised numerous exhibitions internationally and lectures and publishes regularly on photography, visual culture and curatorial and act activism. We will be taking Q&A after the conversation. If you have questions, please enter them in Zoom chat. Our next in conversation in partnership with Autograph will be with Renee and Phoebe Boswell online during the evening of Tuesday, the 15th of February. All details on the RPS website. Over to you, Renee and Lola. Thank you so much for the introduction, Joe, and also Michael, and for hosting this talk. And uh, my biggest thanks, of course, to Lola. Lola Flash, it is a pleasure and a privilege, as always, to be in conversation with you tonight. Um, I would also like to welcome everybody in the audience, either watching, watching this um, live as we speak or watching it at a later stage. So thank you for taking the time and spending this evening with us. Um, so yes, it is, a, it is a pleasure and a privilege to be here tonight and in conversation with you. Lola, you are, in my view, as you well know, one of the most important uh, contemporary artists working tirelessly, brilliantly, incessantly, supportively, uniquely, collaboratively, powerfully, urgently um, for more than three decades, probably close to four decades at this point, although the bio always says for more than three decades, but we wrote that quite a long time ago. Um, so you've been doing this for a very long time. And these uh, front lines, this um, forefront of gender queer visual politics in this space that you've been mining all of those years, um, you, you kind of work through a, a great myriad of interconnected and intersectional biases and isms and phobias, all of those that you challenge continuously from racism to ageism to homo and transphobias and all sorts of other um, injustices, if you will, and not only do you challenge those stereotypes and preconceptions, for me one of the things I, I always think of when I, when I reflect on your work is that the way you claim this photographic space also as a site for visual pleasure, as a site for a kind of reclamation, uh, for representation, for visibility and for difference, for visual justice and for visual equity. Um, and I want to emphasize the four in all of those things because there's a very particular commitment that speaks to this four. It's not necessarily, of course, within the four is embedded and against other things and to undo certain structures, but the four is really important because that requires a very particular commitment and the kind of space that you open up with your work. Um, we've known each other for many, many years. Um, you will see in some of the images that will show, which will only be on screen for a split second for how, how many years. Um, and I've always admired how you, your practice is so firmly rooted within the space of social justice and this um, advocacy and, and, and awareness raising mode of working, whether that's gender, sexual, racial or cultural differences, and also how your art and your life and your activism are so profoundly connected. 
um, through what I've previously in, I think, the essay that you invited me to write for your pen and brush um, catalog a few years ago, I've described as eyes that commit. And in doing so, I borrowed the words of the uh, wonderful writer Naif Yira Wahid, who wrote in her collection of fragments of um, a fragment, a collection of fragments and poems, she, she talked about that notion of eyes that commit and how she wants to see more black and brown bodies both in front of the camera and behind the camera. And I always think of you as somebody with eyes that commit. Um, so that's that. And, and, and those eyes, as, as mentioned both in Joe's introduction and, and said earlier, are really always focused on this lifelong commitment to preserving those legacies of, of different communities of color, queer communities, non-binary, binary communities, gender non-conforming communities, and envisioning and engendering um, and manifesting towards a kind of queer visuality and a queer futurity, if you will. And I think we'll also end up on that notion of a, of a of futurity with, um, with the latest series. Um, and importantly, and it's the last thing I'll say in the introductory bit, um, you've been doing this from in, at a time in the 1980s and 90s when, um, when queer visual arts and words like visual activism weren't on book, they weren't as popular as they are now. They weren't a trope within the art world and within art histories in many ways. It was a tentative and embryonic gesture them and not yet written into art history. And that's where the kind of like legendary pioneering um, intervention that your work represents sits. So um, yes, and mining that trajectory, um, just a couple of um, biographical things. I want to congratulate you on, of course, the fellowship from the RPS. Very well deserved. You're also in wonderful company. So congratulations on that. Um, but also you've been recently awarded in the same year, the end of last year, a Lifetime Achievement Award from Queer Arts. So also congratulations on that. You've been serving on their board for many years. And I also know that you've been investing a lot of your time supporting a very important, probably one of the most um, important and oldest collectives of black photography in the US, the uh, K Moin Gay Collective. I hope I didn't mess that up in my pronunciation. Um, so you've been, you've been working with them for a very long time. And the great media coverage from the New York Times to The Guardian, to the British Journal of Photography, to the NPR lately have really every time my heart just flutters because it's been so long coming. And you so deserve all of the um, attention and recognition finally with the recent acquisitions, the museums and institutions finally embracing and collecting your work in order to preserve this legacy for generations to come. So congratulations on all of that. Um, I'm, I'm super proud of you and I've been living this space with you for the last few decades. So happy to hear all of this. Okay, um, so, and how do you feel? How are you? I'm good. I just, um, thank you for such a wonderful introduction. Um, it is for me too a uh, great opportunity to be together here speaking about my work. Um, you all out there don't know, but I mean, Renee has always like in the in the you know the, the twelfth hour. I'm like, I need a I need a reference. Can, will you do a reference? Will you be my you know? Will you write a reference letter or you know like you've sort of always been there, not only for those kinds of things, but for you know, letting me, giving me a chance to discuss the work and adding to the work. And we'll talk a little bit more about how you've helped title some things, you know? And so it's, it's, um, it's not always that you can have like a best friend that, that can also be uh, in the same kind of headset that you are, the mindset and, you know, have this, the same kind of passion for photography. So it's, it's, it's just been a pleasure. So I'm, I'm super excited to be here with you again. So thank you. Thank you. And um, how how are you feeling? I want to start by just asking you how you are. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm I'm hanging in there. Um, I'm quarantining want... in my apartment. Um, and yeah, I'm okay. I'm excited to to talk about the work. And uh, you know, like you said, it's it is has been a long time coming. Um, I have there are so many accolades that I've I've gotten as of late, and I, I don't even know. I don't believe I really was dreaming about these things. So it's it's like um, cliche, but kind of like icing on the cake. You know, the 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 work is what was important to me, creating the work. And, and of course mm -hmm. the accolades are, are, are wonderful, um, but to be able to still be alive and still creating work, I mean, that's that's what 
at the end of the day is like makes me the happiest. Absolutely. But it's also, I mean, one of the other things is that you, you've never, already you've been working and practicing and creating all of these years since in your early 20s, but you haven't really worked in the commercial sphere. You didn't, you weren't represented by a commercial gallery up until now. You've been also a teacher all of these years, teaching high school students arts. And, you know, in Brooklyn, all people don't necessarily know that you've been developing this visual vernacular and these important bodies of work whilst teaching young kids every day, young people every day, and not having that sort of like, you know, commercial gallery institutional backdrop to those structures to hold you up. So that's even, even more of an impressive achievement. Yeah. Why, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna move on from our um, slide if I can. To oh, and just one this. thing was just that, um, I just wanted to, to oh, uh, give a shout out to Jamu for uh, this lovely portrait he took of me a couple of years ago. And then the other self-portrait was like from like 1985 or something. Amazing, thank you. And I think a jammer will come up again um, later in, the con in our conversation as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to do this slightly chronological um, in terms of taking us through a journey of, of your work. There's about six different bodies of work and we've got about half an hour to discuss those. So do forgive me if I sometimes move us along a little bit, a little bit quick, but um, we wanted to start um, in the 1980s, and with that, um, and, and during that time, you were an active member of ACT UP and Art Plus. And again, it's it's a perfect moment to begin this conversation because it is again where your activism and your art are very um, very profoundly intertwined, if you will. And so during that time, you were be deeply embedded in those crucial campaigns and movements. Um, and this, in many ways, is best um, embodied in your participation in Grand, Grand Fury's um, era-defining billboard panel, Kissing Doesn't Kill, Greed and Indifference Do, from 1989, um, demonstrating just how personal your practice always has been. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that moment in time and maybe the importance of public art to you before we delve deeper into your own work. Yeah, and sorry for the, uh, the sirens today. They've been really kind of crazy, but... Um... Can you still hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> yes, this photograph, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this photograph was, uh, was created by Grand Fury, who did a lot of our adjectprop. You know, um, they did a wonderful, a lot of wonderful campaigns that were very eye catching. This was on the sides of buses. Um, and I always like to read the tagline corporate greed, um, government inaction, and public indifference makes AIDS a political crisis. And you know, fast forward to these times, and we could really just put COVID right in there where it says AIDS. You know, we still have the same uh, marginalized group of folks that are being, you know, uh, triple time, I don't know, quadruple time affected by it, because especially in America and other places where we don't have proper health care, right? And it all has to do with, with, you know, uh, money. <laughs> Um, and, and lack of thereof. And that's me on the end, because um, Julie Tolentino, who uh, was my partner at the time, and uh, Julie has continued to do a lot of great work. Um, this was also a time, 1989, when people thought that you were, that you could get, uh, you, could, you could conceive HIV from, um, from kissing. We used to have kiss-ins and freak everyone out. You know, one minute you'd, you'd kiss a girl, the next minute you'd kiss a guy. You know, just on any random corner. Sometimes we were targeted corners, actually, and uh, so that's where this came out. And it it was really kind of um, it. I think it sent a real message. Um, it also was received. Um, and it was all over. It was a national ad um, campaign, and uh, in, in Chicago, you know, people tarred our faces. So you know, when you think about public art and and what happens to public art and who sees it, you know, there was a real huge reaction to it. Uh, but also people learned from it too. Uh, a friend of mine um, says that, you know, when she saw this, she went and got tested and turns out she was HIV positive. And she, she says that Julie and I saved her life. And I suppose maybe in some ways we did her and possibly other, and most, most probably other folks as well. And during that time, were you making work, Lola? You were starting to create the cross-color work at that time, or was that, was there kind of like- yeah. that... 
Yeah, totally. I was, uh, I was, I was doing, um, I mean, once I came out of college in 81, I, I, that's where I created the cross color process. I continued doing it for 20 years, basically until I got to London, to be honest with you. Um, and <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I started really, I always say I, I kind of started seeing in cross color, you know, I'd see a red wall and I'd be like, Oh, that's going to be such a good green, you know, or, and my friends actually started seeing it in that way too. So that was kind of fun to see people say, oh, Lola, I saw this, this, you know, street corner that would be perfect in cross color. Um, and just, you know, just kind of uh, quickly, the idea was that I used the wrong papers to create the images um, instead of using uh, positive paper, because I was shooting on slides and still do, um, I was printing on to, to the negative paper. So I got negative color, uh, which I then coined cross color. Um, so in this picture, for instance, I knew that photographing in a pool, which is the cool color of the blue, would be a warm color. And I really pushed it to kind of have the blood, you know, look of blood. Mm -hmm. But then, um, I mean, with the, I was just gonna say what's so interesting is that both literally and metaphorically, the, all of the things that you express through that ingenious cross color process way work because if we think about this this piece being done in the context of the AIDS crisis at the time and then that pool of blood like turning that blue pool into a pool of blood and what that says about you know questions around antibodies and bodies in that space floating in that space but also just playing um, with that very binary of, of negative and positive and then creating that kind of um, camouflage mode of representing people of different cultural backgrounds with different skin tones, but at the same time also protecting them because you're protecting them from recognition at the same time whilst you represent them. So there's that wonderful kind of dynamic and, um, and currency in, in that way of working. Yeah, and I have to be honest with you, maybe we can move to another one. Like I, I, uh, I didn't really realize all of that, you know? I mean, I, I loved it. I loved so much um, about being able to, cause like, you know, I was always sort of a fan of surrealism. And so I love this sort of like kind of collage Sometimes it has like a collage look to it. I liked how it kind of, that it was definitely like not what photography was supposed to be. Um, I liked that a lot. Um, and that, you know, in the end, that's why I think a lot of people didn't like it. And I didn't get a lot of sort of like love from it. Um, but, you know, understanding that I can make uh, first black people white and white people black and then like blue and different mm -hmm. colors, like you said, like removing um, this idea of, of race, um, the color, like the binary color, just like totally like obliterated that. Um, you know, sometimes I wonder if it was because I was young and I wasn't able to really talk about it in the way that I am now, um, that it was often left out of, always really left out of act up shows. Um, I also think about the fact that it was such an early, um, photography is, you know, such a young um, practice or, or one of the youngest arts. And, and I think that, you know, first it was black and white and then it was color. And I feel like this jump to this, this cross color was really something that people weren't quite ready for. The whole idea of like photography is supposed to, you know, like what you see is what you get kind of thing. And it's supposed to be like documentary and such that I, there was just a lot of pushback for this work. And then kind of, maybe we go to the next one. Oh, this actually, oh, this, the um, AIDS is killing artists. The inscription on the quilt is so important. Yeah, so the AIDS is killing artists, now homophobia is killing art. That's a t-shirt that uh, we made, uh, Art Positive made. Um, and we were like a kind of like spin-off group from, you know, the ACT UP. There were a lot of different affinity groups was what we were called. And um, so that was, I knew that by um, folding the shirt up and putting it in the square, the white square, it would you would kind of not be able to know that it was just a folded up t-shirt. That those are the kinds of things that mm -hmm. I really loved about the cross color. Um, yeah. And I, I kept that uh, that black and white. It's actually a, um, a sheet. I kept, I kept that for a very long time. Um, it's awesome. Yeah. And then like I realized like Malik uses it, right? The photographer. Malik City Bay, yes. Yes. Yeah. And I was I was not aware of that at the time. 
yeah, 1950s, mid-century Bamako photography that, that sort of reappears there. That's an interesting dialogue, actually, that one could have there. Um, I'm, mm. I'm also just thinking, I mean, as the, the so both uh, politically, like politically and visually, they represent that, that time in terms of the messages that are in each of those images, there's a message embedded one way or another. And I was just, as you were reading the inscription on the t-shirt, I was thinking, of course, if we look at that within a, in a UK context as well, this is, um, you know, Thatcherite politics, Clause 28, all of that, that actually um, made it virtually impossible for public institutions and publicly funded bodies to support any art that was in any way seen as advocating for queer politics or, or um, Etc. So we need to remember that it, that that was also the context of of that time, of course. And this is a self-portrait, did we say? Yes. Yes. Um, okay. And so when you develop this particular uh, visual photographic vernacular here, you were saying that people didn't really pick up on it. They didn't necessarily get it. They didn't understand what you were doing because it was neither straightforward documentary nor did it fit neatly into a kind of like fine art canon at the time. What did you do with them? You were a full-time activist, but what did you do with the images? You didn't exhibit them. You didn't publish them at that point. Where were they? No, there's like a lot of noise outside. I hope this bother you guys. Um, I, hear it. I don't think so. Oh, okay, it's just bothering me. <laughs> Um, you know, I have to be honest, Renee, I really did not do much with the work. I mean, I, I created it. Uh, I went to the dark room. There was like a few dark rooms, like around the 30th street that I used to go up there and print and I come happily home and just, uh, put my, put the prints like under my bed where they, many of them still are. Um, I didn't, you know, I, I, my schooling was from fine art background, so I didn't really have any any want to do anything commercially with them. Um, and I was really, you know, when I think more and more, I think about that time period, I was so ensconced in being an, a full-time activist. You know, I was either, all of us were, so many of us were, we were, we went to the meetings, right? There was a main meeting on Monday at the, at the um, LGBTQ center. Um, and then there were all these, like I said, all these other affinity groups that we would go to um, the meetings. And I can remember like going to, every time I'd go to a meeting, I'd say, okay, you're not gonna join another group, you know? And then someone would have a really good idea for a group. And I, before I know it, I would, I would end up, you know, joining this group and um, going to demonstrations. These are, you know, this one on the left-hand side is from a demonstration um, at the NIH in, in um, uh, Maryland. Um, and then of course we were going to funerals. Uh, we were just going like, uh, you know, to the hospital to visit people like Ray and, and Anthony, his partner. Um, so it was just like a cycle. It was a crazy, crazy cycle. Um, so yeah, so the work really just did not have a, a life of, of its own uh, other than just me um, documenting the times. And again, I didn't think I was a documentary photographer either, you know. Um, so now to see the work, you know, hanging in MoMA and soon the Whitney, it's, you know, work that I did in the 80s and 90s. It's, it's really kind of, it's amazing. You know, I say it as, again, I use the word surreal again, but it is very surreal to, to see the work and to think like that work has just been sitting under my bed for Literally under your bed, like literally in boxes it's, under your bed. It, Still, still a lot of it is, although now I'm actually working towards scanning a lot of them because that's really what I should have done back in the day. But, you know, that's very costly. Yeah. And uh, what made me, do you think the content, we're going to have to move on quite quickly, although I would love to ask you a lot more questions about this series here, but I just wonder, so they were part, they formed part of a body of work called the Gay to Z, and then there were the um, AIDS art, so, and then there the Fire Island portrait. So I think it's almost like three sorts of three series that form the cross color uh, body of work, if I understand correctly. And like here, would you mind just for like a minute talking about an image like that, which has always stayed with me since I first saw it, you know, two decades ago. Just yeah. connotation. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think that's the other thing about like, about getting older is like, seeing the change and then seeing things that have not changed one bit, you know? Um, so this was part of the Gay to Z. I, I believe I had a show at the Metro Cinema down in Soho. Um, and so that was, um, so this was, this was shown there and this was called K is for KKK. Each letter of the alphabet had, uh, you know, some of them were funny, 
some of them were sexy, like B was for breast. Um, but this one had to do with the with the racism within the gay, the queer, queer community. And uh, I actually made those hoods, you know, I sew a little bit. So I made those hoods and I was, I can remember trembling when I was sewing them because I was thinking how many other people are making these, you know, cause I was in Massachusetts, which is, you know, has its issues. And uh, so that's what this one's about. That was taken in Provincetown. A lot of the series was photographed in Provincetown. And then um, these are the last two images in the um, that we're showing now in the cross color series. And uh, the foray, I think, was just acquired by a major museum as well. Foray is the image with the wheelchair on the left side. And here, I mean, there's just a quite a contrast in many ways to the KKK image. We, we just look that there is this melancholia, sort of like quiet yet equally somber tone embedded within that and that sense of, of loss that is inscribed, I think in some ways in every single one of the images in the cross color series, or at least I read them that way. And then the one next to it is, um, was taken also on Fire Island of, of Tadir. Do you, I mean, maybe, is there something else you wanna, you wanna say about the series before we, finish or should we move on? Well, I think I just always like, I remember like going to see like shows like Wolf, Wolfgang Tillman shows. And, you know, I was always uh, admired that he was able to, to show so many different kinds of work. And I used mm -hmm. to think to myself, I want to be like that one day that I, you know, I will, you know, hopefully I'll be able to go back to cross color. So I, I used to always sort of have that in my mind. And then I just totally forgot about cross color because I started getting into, as, as you'll see, I started getting into the four by five camera and I just started loving that so much that, um, yeah, I mean, I, just really quickly, I love to talk about the story about uh, pen and brush when they came to see my work uh, for like the last time for my solo show that they gave me in 2018. Mm -hmm. And they were like, is, is there anything else you have? And I said, well, there's this work under my bed and so we go into my bedroom and it was almost like a Bart Simpson moment. Like it felt like they were going, why haven't you told us about this before, you know? And I was like, well, I don't, you know, and they were like, oh, I can see how it works with this, it works with that. So, you know, I suppose for any, any budding photographers out there, like, you know, make sure you hold on to your work and, and maybe review it every once in a while, you know, like think about, don't dismiss it. Even, you know, maybe other people didn't think it was that great, but you know, if you loved it, it's you should keep it close to your heart. That's a really good point. Beautifully said. I, I was thinking earlier when I was looking at the slides in the presentation, and particularly that image, which is also the, the foray. And I know it's a homage to somebody who for to Ray who passed uh, away at the time. And it reminded me of um, this wonderful. A quote by the late um, Jose Esteban Munoz. I think I've shared it with you before. Um, there's a book he wrote in 2009, I think, called Cruising Utopia, the Den and Day of Queer Futurity. And he writes about the, uh, in, 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 that in, I quote, the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. And so that really sits really beautifully, I think, with that image, that idea of a warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. And in that text, um, it's, I think it's the opening passage to the book, um, the, the foreword, where he writes about queering as a longing that propels us onward beyond romances of the negative and the toiling in the present. Queerness is that thing that lets us feel that this world is not enough, that indeed something is missing. You have to send that to me. That's beautiful. I'll send it to you. I think I've sent it before, but anyway, so foray for me it dialogues beautifully with that text. Um, mm. Okay, so we're going to make a really big jump now, and we only have about twenty minutes left. Not even that for our conversation. So we we're going to jump to a very different color palette and a very different time. You are so we were in America up until now in the nineteen eighties. We're now in around nineteen ninety, and you are moving to London. And. This is us in London in 2000. I'm not going to say much about this, but this is around, we met about 10 years after you moved to London. Um, this was taken at the London College of Communication where we both studied. Back then it was the London College of Printing and you photographed me and I photographed you. Um, so this is you in red and I didn't know you were wearing red today. <laughs> that is quite funny actually with your Pam Greer um, t-shirt, strange serendipity. Um, so this, I was doing my BA degree at the time and you were doing your MA at the London College of Printing. Um, I'm going to jump onto the next image unless you want to say something. 
about no, that. What's the name of that series that you were doing? Um, I love myself when I'm laughing and then again when I'm looking mean and impressive, but it's a quote by Sora Neely Hurston. And it's all, yeah, yeah. yeah. We Thank can you. talk about it. You're welcome. And you were in it. So you featured in my first series that I exhibited at the time. So yeah. You look kind of the same. <laughs> Thanks. You do too. <laughs> Not the bit. So 20 years ago. Okay, we move on. Um, this is, um, so now this is a time when you, to, around 2000, 1999, um, and I had the great pleasure of being photographed by you back then, but also a couple of years ago. In, 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 and this was um, the beginning of surpassing. Um, I'm gonna move on from this image and I'll move on to surpassing. Um, and at this point, you embarked on a new, in a new chapter in your artistic career. You embraced, um, large format color photography and conventional color film for the first time. So from the cross color, we move on to this. And before we, um, before we speak about the works in the series, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that time and what it meant for you to move to London and the kind of different environment you were in, the people you met. I know there's artists like Sunil Gupta or Joy Gregory who are also um, Royal Photographic Society Honorary Fellows. Um, who you met back then. So would you mind talking a little bit just briefly about, about that time and then I'll, I'll do a quick introduction to surpassing. Yeah, um, when I, I've been thinking about it since we've been talking about, you know, my, when I came to London and I can't remember who told me, but I remember like someone told me before I left uh, for London that um, you should reach out to Sunil Gupta and they told me about autograph and so as soon as I got there, I called him or I think we wasn't even, there weren't emails then. So I must've called him. I definitely did not text him because there were no cell phones back then. Um, but I remember, pardon? Yeah, pages, pages. You know, you would send a page. Do you could remember have, that? Been, yeah, yes. um, and yeah. I got in touch with him and I, he was living in um, Brixton at the time. And Joy was at his house, Joy Garrett Gregory, because they're best friends. And uh, yeah, so that's how I kind of got immersed in, you know, an understanding of what was going on photographically in London. And, you know, I was only supposed to stay for two, two months. I ended up staying for 12 years. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of how that whole thing started. And then when we were fast forward, when we were in school and, um, you know, I, I was doing my master's and you were doing your undergraduate work, um, you were you were working at Autograph part time, right? You were an intern there, um, so you know. And to now see Autograph in all its glory with that beautiful building, you know, it's just uh, it, it's it's wonderful to see the traje to traje that trajectory. Um, so, do you want to talk a little about surpassing, or you want me to talk a little bit about it? Mm, well, yes, I would like you to talk about it, but I'll just maybe I'll just do a. a a brief bridge um, because what one of the things I mean I remember when when you when you were developing the work and when we were talking about you developing that work and maybe you can talk about that part a little bit more but I just like at the time seeing those images and those images are larger than life of course they're four by five they were printed huge and to just see these um, these figures in this you know wonderful new body of work that you were producing so reassuringly um, centered so monumentally striking and beautifully lit and elevated and literally you were photographing on top on rooftops there was always that kind of like vantage point that sense of elevating the black subject and the brown subject if you will um, and um, and I was just you know I think all of us were blown away by that degree show for your masters that you did and, and just that care and precision and consideration and dedication, how you were rendering these figures through your eye and through your, your camera and that, um, that sort of, um, that space of semi-abstraction, if you will, from the cross color works was kind of giving away to this sort of new assertive realist space, if you will, and, and, and to put these figures into an unobstructed view, you know, into a very particular space of focus and that gaze that was of course, um, referencing bell hooks as oppositional, oppositional gaze, oppositional look. So those were all of the kind of cultural theory that we were reading at the time. You know, uh, Corbin Mercer's pigment work on pigmentocracy, bell hooks on, on on the gaze and occupation of space and claiming that space. So I could just it was so wonderful to see how how that cultural theory work and your dedication to representation all came together in that series. I mean, it was just it was it was 
just a wonderful moment. So that's that's kind of all I wanted to say as an introduction to surpassing. There's lots more to say. Thank you. But, yeah. Um, I mean, thank you for contextualizing it in that way. Um, you know, it, the series, every series comes from some kind of interaction, um, for, for me at least. And this was to do with the fact that when I moved to London, everyone used to always say, here, this is Lola. They'd introduce me as, this is Lola, she's a photographer. Or they'd say, um, you know that mixed race girl, Lola. And, um, you know, I would just stamp my foot. I was like, I'm not mixed race. And of course, there's nothing wrong with being mixed race, but I'm not, you know, my mom just happened to be super light skin and my dad was dark skin, but like, this is how I came out. And of course, in, in America, we don't look at people like me as mixed great race, right? We're just like African Americans because we have a range of colors, skin tones. And so I start, it started made me think more about the idea of passing and my grandmother who was very light skinned, she had freckles, um, she could pass, you know, they, we, all of us cousins, we knew that when she went to buy ticket, tickets down South, she would, she would stand in the white lines, right? But then when she got on the train, she would sit in the, in, the, in the colored section. So we were all aware of that, but I started thinking more and more about my skin tone and with people calling me mixed race, I kept thinking, well, you know, I wonder what, what kind of advantages I've had from being light skinned. You know, I never really thought I was really that different. I always was very aware of being black, but I never really thought about my skin tone helping me. Anyway, that kind of made me think about, that's what I'm gonna talk about in this series. And in fact, you know, so I knew I was talking about passing, right? And in fact, you're the one, I think you forgot, but you're the one who put the sir part in, right? You put the sir in passing, because you were like, Lola, what about sir? I think that would be, you know, because we're talking about being above passing, like, you know, this sort of new era of just walking in there with braids or whatever we might have, right? Not straightened hair, right? Hair that's natural. And so, um, and then, you know, I learned to, that learned to look at the, much to my dismay, um, but, you know, I was kind of forced to look at the um, Italian, um, you know, masters and how they photographed the, uh, the royalty, you know, up on high vistas. And so, you know, it was interesting for me to sort of like take that, to make a spin on it, to bring it back to these people who sometimes I often call like these sort of Shakespearean uh, mm -hmm. characters, right? And so um, it's, uh, it's, I think that this, in so many ways, is, this feels like my lifelong series. Um, of course, I love all of my series, but this one feels like it has so much of, uh, all of my other work in it you know there's people who are queer but it's not really about being queer it's about your skin tone but you know you, when you think about intersectionality you can't separate those things right so um yeah it's it's it's, it's been um this is one of my students actually I, he's in sweden now i got in touch with him and sent him a um, one this is actually on top of um lcc this is mm -hmm. on top, yeah mm -hmm. this was in the degree show i think at the time and but of course you continue the series and there's all sorts of different global diasporic figures who now feature in it from Brazil to New York to Cape Town to London. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one of the things that I find so wonderful as well is that that oppositional gaze in many ways is quietly confrontational. It's assertive, but it's not threatening. It's basically just, it's, it's, it's opening up this space of uh, revelation, reflection, revolution that just says, I'm here, see me engage with me, recognize me, acknowledge me, see me for who I am. I'm looking at you, you're looking at me, but it's a, it's a, it opens up a dialogue. It's an invitation. I, I see them as invitations and gentle provocations. Yeah, and I think that I always, I like that word gentle because I think that when I, when I choose my models, you know, I see that in them. I see this sense of kindness in them. And, um, and so I know that when they, when I, they look at me, and when they look into my camera lens, that I'm going to get that from them, you know, uh, for sure. Um, you know, because historically we weren't allowed to look at Massa in the eyes, right? So it's so much of the work is about present day, but so, you know, it's a lot of it has to do with, with the history that, uh, you know, the horrific history that my folks have survived from. And talking about surviving and 
racisms and histories and discriminations, you also have um, some figures in the series who are more in the public eye, if you will. So we've got Professor Henry Louis Gates here, who's um, one of the most foremost scholars, of course, in terms of African-American literature and African-American studies, a renowned Harvard professor, somebody we've collaborated with over many years, um, but also somebody who even in his, you know, friend of Barack Obama, but still in his, um, in his privilege and in his statue, if you will, still subjected to racism. In when was that taken? 2010 or 2011, but not too long ago. And, you know, we, we, I don't think we have enough time for the story, but not, 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 nothing basically protects Black people in America from that kind of treatment even today. Yes, yeah, for sure. I mean, I still, it's still, I still sometimes have trouble getting a cab, you know, so it's, it's definitely not gone. And, and Skip, I mean, Skip Gates here was arrested opening his own front door at Harvard because a neighbor assumed that he doesn't live there. And that's really what I was trying to get it. So you've got a renowned Harvard professor arrested by the police for entering his own house. Yes, and I'm smiling not because of that happened, but I just have to really quickly say, um, so after this, after the after the photo shoot, you know, he was like, so what are you doing now? And um, I said, well, I'm just going to gather my stuff and get back on the bus. Mm -hmm. He's like, you came up here with all with all this equipment on the bus. I'm like, yeah, like you were saying, I'm a high, I'm a teacher, right? So I didn't couldn't afford to I don't have a car. And so he said, I'll, I'll get my um, driver to take you to the station. Anyway, really quickly, we stopped by his house. And as he's opening the door to that famous house, now famous house, or infamous, infamous house, he said, um, yeah, I got into a little trouble coming into my house the, the other day. And I said, yeah, we heard about it. <laughs> and they just kind of laughed, you know. Front, that was Guardian front page news at the time. Yeah, yeah. He, he was, it, it was wonderful meeting him. And that was partly due to your help too. So thank you for that. Pleasure, pleasure. Um, and then this is the last image in, in surpassing that we'll discuss. And then we've got literally five minutes to, to get to the rest through the rest of our presentation. I don't know where time's gone. Um, and mm -hmm. here, of course, we've got the wonderful, um, legendary Carrie Mae Weems um, photographed in New York about 10 years ago or so. Would you talk, there's a beautiful anecdote attached to this moment. Would yeah, you just really briefly. Um, so before I photograph um, for this particular series, I, you know, once I get everything all lined up, I say to them, okay, think about power and think about pride and think about someone that you admire. And so Carrie says, cause first she's all like, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? So I told her that. And so she says, oh, that's easy. I'll just think of you. And with that, I sort of like, <laughs> sort of hid behind my, under my, my, you know, my focusing cloth. And I was like, okay, keep it together, Lola, keep it together. You'll be able to do it, you know? Um, but yeah, she's, she's amazing. I, I, I love her. I love her work. Um, I don't know. I wonder, should we go back down to, um, should we just kind of go through them and then talk about syzygy to possibly? Yes. yes, we'll do that. I just want to acknowledge here the exhibition at Autograph that took place in 2018, your solo show, um, which is uh, co-curated with the brilliant Bindi Vora, my colleague at Autograph. So that was a real pleasure to finally present your work at the gallery. And that brought together surpassing legends and the cross color work. So, and this is um, you in, in, in front of an installation of legends on the one side, and then we've got Robert Taylor. So it was Robert Taylor. Yeah, that's Robert great, Taylor there. Really important um, uh, black queer photographer here in the UK. So it was a beautiful moment also to see all of that support and everybody who showed up for you. Um, on the opening night, that was great to see, and throughout the show, really. Um, and then maybe, Lola, let's give ourselves a challenge. Let's, let's do one minute on legends, and then one minute on surpassing, and one minute on salt. So that's three minutes. I'm going to time it, and then we end on, on, on Sizushi. So legends, um, all I'm going to say is that it's a, it's a tribute to all of, all of those um, important members of the queer and non-binary, non-gender conforming community around you, and all of those Anyway, you 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 go. I won't do my spiel. Yeah, I mean, Legends is is uh, it's a little different from the other series because it's really about those folks who, um, you know, in their own way became role models. So there are people that are kind of my age group, you know, a little bit older, a little bit younger. And we, you know, we grew up, we didn't have the L word, we didn't have, um, you know, advertisements for queer folks on public transport. Um, 
no helplines, right? So these are kind of the people that I feel helped create, you know, these role models for the young folks to come. And why did you, um, so we've got Sunil Gupta on, on, yes, on the Sunil. image on the, Sunil on the, uh, I'm so bad with left and right, on the right side, on my mm. right side. Um, and then there's also other brilliant artists who feature in the series like a Jammu or Campelex. Um, so one yeah, of the constituency of- Sorry, Murray Hill's here on the left-hand side. Murray Hill's a big fi figure here, very funny person. Yes. So it's, it's just gorgeous how you create this constituency, this sort of like family of people and that notion of representing one another, which is really a foundational part of your practice to represent and make each other visible, right? Even if- Yeah, and also to remind them that they actually are, you know, role models. Like, I don't think a lot of these people, you know, they're, they're very humble. They don't really see, they're just being themselves, but I don't think they see that how much influence they have on on uh, on, our, on our whole community and, and particularly the young the young folks that's a jamu that was taken and taken an autograph in london in 2017 or 2018 oh gosh was it that long ago yeah it was just before campbell. hey campbell i know you're out there striking a pose um and main the main attraction main used to be a, a dancer when i was like back in the day when i was a bartender in new york yeah click club yeah I'll have to go through them very quickly, okay? Yeah. Just so okay. that to the others. So that's Legends. And then there's you, the legend, posing in Legends. Mm -hmm. And here Legends um, installed a pen and brush, I believe. Yes. And mm -hmm. That takes us to um, the next series as surmise, where at the core of this body of work is um, the notion of gender fluidity. Would you, and I think if, you, if I remember correctly, you've told me once that they were inspired by Richard Evidence and the American West series with the backdrop and the kind of like straight. And then the idea behind that was to just focus on the people in the photograph, no gloss, no distractions, no other colors, just that kind of focus on, on representing and, and making them visible. Yeah, for sure. I really just wanted to, you know, like I was saying, I use like kind of almost copy style lighting. You know, I didn't want to make the lighting any dramatic. I didn't want to sort of, you know, it was just almost like a scientist, you know, looking at these folks like this is us. And, uh, you know, as they said in the New York Times, get used to it. <laughs> Um, and also obviously to keep, you know, it keeps sort of a continuity as I photograph people. Um, I photographed them in London, in Trinidad, in New York, and that's it so far. I want to go out to LA and other places. Yes. I can switch off my phone for some bizarre reason. Um, so this is an ongoing body of work as well, like with your others. And um, so I'm just going to show a few more. Do you want to say something briefly about this one? Because the image also, I think we talked about this briefly the other day. Um, the, the person depicted here is somebody who you've mentored over the years, who's also- Yeah, yeah, I love, I love this is Belly. I, I love Belly to death. Um, Belly calls me Ma Pa. Billy, you know, I think of Feli as my son and, um, you know, there I'm part of, as you said, I'm on the board of Queer Art and we have a wonderful, wonderful mentorship program. And one of the good things about COVID is that it's made it so that we have like a national, um, actually international um, sort of um, net now because most of the um, most of the interactions are online. And so Feli was my uh, mentor, a uh, mentee. A couple of years ago, but we'll have a continuous relationship. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's a two way street, you know, Feli keeps my website looking good. And, you know, I give them a lot of different advice from, you know, photographic to, to girlfriends, you know what I mean? So it, it's, a, it's a beautiful experience. And I'm starting off with a new, uh, a new mentor, mentee this year, Antonia Savoy. Yeah. Wonderful. And um, so here, are, I think those are the last oh, two yeah. images in this series. Mm. But I think I one of the things that- in Utah, and then that's Tenzin, who's now a teenager on his way to uh, college, uh, Yale. Wonderful. I was going to, just as a bridge to, I mean, I'm completely failing at timing the three minute thing, but we're getting close. So um, as, as a bridge to the, to the next um, body of work, 
one of the things I was thinking about when I was looking at the slides um, in, in connection to each other is that I really love the way that you not only urge us and inspire us to look and see differently, but that that difference that you champion is not always easily defined or predictable, and it doesn't just sit within you know, one particular type of sexual or cultural difference, if you will. I think I said that briefly in the introduction as well. So the way that, say, these wonderful women in SALT, this series, sit alongside these gender fluid um, figures of all sorts of different backgrounds and ages is really wonderfully special and, and quite rare. And this mode of, of queering that you practice is so sublime and transgressive. Um, in that way that it doesn't discriminate in any shape or form and, and continuously probes our, you know, our own biases, if you will, asks to ask our, us to look at our own biases around age or sex, et cetera, and, and just to open up and, and make those definitions even more unstable, you know? But um, so, that, so that, that's something that I, I, I really admire as well about your work. And if, if you would, Lola, just, um, tell us, tell us in, 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 in how, how salt emerged and also why you are not in salt yet. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So I usually sort of in the beginning of my talks talk about the, the idea of bias. Um, I always kind of like to think about my work as like kind of like a, a quilt or a tapestry of, of, of my life, you know, and so it's, it's all about me. And but certain parts of me, you know, I always have, um, I, my mom was a single mom. So I sort of always had this love for my grandma and older older women. I always knew the the wealth in their knowledge. I always knew that they were wise, you know? And so uh, Salt started like that. This is uh, Tony Parks on the left-hand side, Gordon's daughter, also a great photographer. And Corrine Simpson, also a wonderful photographer. Um, and so I just, you know, started thinking about wanting to photograph them. Actually, I kind of, to be, to be honest with you, I started photographing a similar series with a friend in London well, she was a writer. Um, yeah, I remember that. Commission. Yeah, yeah, commission for the women's life. And then I came back to um, I came back to America, and I thought, I think I want to start that up again, you know. And I, to be honest, I never really took a great uh, four by five uh, portrait of my mom, and so in, in many ways, this is kind of like in in honor of my mom, um, and you know, it's it's for women who are over 70, basically, who are still doing, you know, their lives work. So either they're still doing their still creating, or they're, you know, singing or whatever it is, they're not sitting in front of a TV, you know, waiting to, to croak, you know, so. Um, and so on the other side is Corrine Simpson, right? The other, this is, this is Tony Park's daughter. Tony Park. Yeah, Tony Park. And then there's, um, is it Corrine? Yes, Corrine, yeah. Who, of course, was one of the, you know, also pioneering Black photographer, who's, you know, yes, often overlooked sure. and we forget about her. Yes, for sure. She's actually in the African American Museum um, here in Washington, D.C., which I'm really happy about. And, and here and there, her work seems to be getting picked up. But yeah, I don't mind if you go on. Okay. Um, Agnes Gunn, Ruth Pointer from the Pointer Sisters. Um, and, and just like in Surpassing, I, I like to sort of like, um, include people who are famous to people that are just maybe famous within their own communities, because aging is something that happens to all of us, right? And particularly women. Uh, I mean, I know we're sort of short on time, but this young lady um, who's a um, um, beauty beauty pageant just just um, committed suicide, and it had a lot to do with aging. You know, she's only thirty, and so reading about her uh, her, her passing, you know, made, made me really think more about how important this series is and how important it is to talk about getting older because see I see I still see the beauty in these women you know and I, I want to hear their stories you know and I think that you all can see the beauty as well. Absolutely so you so you have to qualify you have to be 70 to qualify to enter SALT you are definitely not 70 yet so all of your bodies of work, as far as I know, are always ongoing and continuous. There isn't really an end point. But with this, you've told me that once, um, once you enter the series, so once you turn 70 in a number of years, that's, that's kind of like the conclusion of SALT. But when you turned 60 a few years ago, you started your kind of, you know, current body of work. I'm going to call it current, although the other ones are also current body of work. But but in 
interesting as well is that here in this, um, and as we've seen in all of those images we just looked at, you appear in all of the series one way or another. So self-portraiture isn't the new mode of working for you. You always, you are, you are a participant and you're behind the camera in your series. And so here in, in, in this body of work, a lot of these sort of various, um, I, I, in some ways, everything kind of intersects, I would say. There's elements from all of those different bodies of works. And you, um, you playfully uh, express ideas of freedom, flight, escape, confinement, protection, something utopian and fantastical and futuristic about them, but they're also very much anchored in the present. So there's Black Lives Matter references, there's uh, symbolism that, that we can interpret as, as you know, belonging to sl uh, transatlantic slave trade narratives, there's politics of incarceration. So all of the things that you've been working with in, in, in every other body of work um, since the 1980s kind of comes together and is synthesized, if you will, in, in, in this body of work here. Maybe, um, so for the last couple of minutes, if you could just talk a little bit about how the um, idea of this body of work first emerged the key symbolisms around the orange and the blue and the kind of minimalist palette that you that you that you work with here that almost takes you back to the cross color in a funny kind of way. It really does. It does feel like a real loop. Um, thinking about color wise, um, for for sure. And um, you know, it was in talking to you. You know, talking to you earlier, like planning this, I totally forgot that how I started this project was when I was at Autograph um, and uh, I had my solo show there and I met up with Jayashree, uh, who was um, the um, curator for the um, the Ford Foundation show. She had done the first three uh, big shows, amazing shows. So she said, oh, you know, I said, I said, I said so let's, you're going to be in New York, I mean, in London, I'm going to be in London, let's meet at Autographs. So we did. And um, so she said, my next project is going to be Afrofuturism. So if you can get something together. Luckily, I had just gone to, I, I, I was in, the, in a few weeks time, I was going to the Center for Photography of Woodstock for my, uh, for residency. Anyway, mm -hmm. I rushed back to the boys flat and I bought this helmet online and had it shipped to my apartment, you know, and then I was like, oh my gosh, the orange matches the, my prison uniforms because I have a whole bunch of prison uniforms because I've been obsessed with and concerned with about incarceration in America. Um, and so, yeah, so it just all came together, you know? Um, and so in the, in like what you're, I like what you're saying because I feel like the way I'm making it, because it's going to be, a, it's a story, right? It's a narrative and it's Afro, it's based on Afrofuturism. So it's talking about the past, the present and the future, you know, and I don't really know how it's going to, like what the chapters are going to be. So I, I'm, I'm kind of making, I've said it before, like I'm kind of looking at each photo as like a post-it note so that I can kind of move them around to sort of make the, the story ebb and flow. Uh, but I do know that at the end, we're going to be free <laughs> and we're going to have equity. So I don't know what that's going to look like. I think it might have some Photoshop involved, um, me <laughs> sitting up on the moon or something, <laughs> um, but it's going to happen. Um, yeah. And there are these wonderful references um, some within, within some of the images where you can see other moments and other um, I don't know, can't think of a word right now, but there's a reference there. Do you want to say something about it or should I just? I kind of, you know, I'm a big, I, one of, you know, one of my favorite uh, bands when I was a kid was, uh, where was the Beatles? It's like my first album I bought was a Beatles album, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and so when I, when I went to London um, in 2020, I immediately thought about going up there. And actually what I wanted to do here was to do like um, this, that kind of uh, evolution of, you know, like the evolution thing, um, the, you know, the apes, I wanted to like be like down like this and then go across the street. I've seen that done for album covers, um, but there, believe it or not, there was like more traffic than you could imagine. So, uh, you know, I, I kept thinking, you know, I'll go back and, you know, when I'm able to afford to get the street closed off, I'll go back and, and do it again. But actually a Jammu helped me with, with this. So mm -hmm. I often, um, because it, I've been photographing a lot of this during COVID, um, I, I could photograph a lot of it by myself, you know, on a self timer, but you know, it's sort of like that feeling of wanting to get out there and just get back home quickly. Um, I've been f having uh, various friends help me 
um, with the process. And you said you just mentioned COVID and pandemic. So, so half of the images I believe in the series right now were taken during that time. And there is that sense of isolation, empty tube carriages, um, that sort of like locked down deserted underground space. But then there is also, or, or, or like here, but then there are also these moments at the beginning where water is very kind of like present, that idea of water, of course, within, within sort of like black, history has a very particular connotation and a very particular charge with bodies lost at sea and, and, and transatlantic um, slave trade and all of that. And at the same time, I said earlier, there is also that very particular political anchor within those campaigns and movements around social justice and racial justice that were unfolding at the same time, you know, also in tandem with, with the pandemic. So it's, it's, it's really interesting how you brought all of those together. Yeah, well, you know, when I when um, I was sitting here, when you know, when COVID first came, and I was looking out my window, and like, there's hardly any cars, and you know, I was just thinking, God, this city is like so quiet. I should take advantage of it. I actually think a friend of mine said you should take advantage of it. So I started creeping outside and taking pictures, you know, with these quiet streets. Uh, and then when when poor Mr. George George Floyd was killed, um, the city erupted, and there were helicopters and everything, and I. I thought I've got to go, you know, Syzygy has to go. Syzygy is kind of like an avatar, like kind of like my alter ego. I was like, Syzygy has to go to a demonstration. So I went up to Harlem and um, I participated in this particular uh, um, demonstration. Um, so yeah, so we'll see, you know, I really want to go uh, to, to the continent and I really want to go to, um, well, I'm hoping to go to, to Black Rock, to Senegal. Um, and um, and I'm also excited. I'm going to back to to Fire Island this summer and do some more photographs in the water in the uh, pool um, because uh, again the water has a lot to do with like you said the transatlantic slave trade and um, it's a very important part to me. You know I think of all these people like with afros like you know mermaids under the water with afros sitting around and you know living their best life because they didn't have to go through the slavery that we all did you know in our, in the, our various countries but there's also that sense of like it's almost like you're returning to that sense of abstraction right there is a kind of surrealist quality to those images and it feels to me that there's a kind of confident and serene space in the sense that it's, it's almost like you're reaching some kind of equilibrium in your practice you know and you often um, you, you talk about magic and the kind of intuitive and fluid way that your work evolves and I can see that in, in Syzygy and especially when you started submerging yourself in in the water as well this this this, this equilibrium that I think that just it just feels kind of like where you are in your, in your career at this point and um, I, I think we've gone on for way too long and I apologize my timekeeping has not been great so um, I but it was so beautiful to listen to you and I you know I could continue and ask you a lot more questions but Michael and Joe will be very annoyed with me if I do so I know Michael's just switched his video back on apologies for the slightly longer length um, thank you so much Lola for for those wonderful insights and elaborations and your generosity and kindness and brilliance as as always um, Michael can you please allow people or yourself to ask a few more questions we, can you we still do that Absolutely. Um, I mean, it certainly wasn't a hardship to listen to you both. So Lola and Rene, thank you so much for that very, very insightful and um, wonderful conversation between two people that clearly have worked and know each other, have known each other for so long. And I think that came across in that conversation. So thank you for that. Um, I, we will share the chat with you both afterwards because there's some very beautiful and thoughtful thanks to both of you in those. But I'd like to just get to the questions, if I may, as, in, as we have only I'm slightly overrun, but I think everyone will stay with us. Um, so uh, we have a question here from it's either De La Grace Volcano or Volcano De La Grace. Um, and he or she or they is asking, um, how do you think about the question of responsibility in terms of representing your community? Do you restrict yourself at all, at all in terms of who you work with within the LGBTQI+, especially those parts of the equation that are only tangentially connected, for example, trans people and intersex people? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, 
each of my series sort of like has a certain sort of like, I don't know, qualification uh, or uh, description that, that everyone, I mean, let's see, how can I explain it? I have several different series that speak to different issues. So, so I think uh, like the legend series or the surmise series um, that, you know, surmise was, I was very happy that was, was just uh, shown in um, uh, the New York Times. How can I forget that? <laughs> it was just shown in the New York Times. And uh, that is really about, uh, I would say quickly gender fluid folks. Um, and so for sure, you know, um, to me, I look at our, I look at our community like with a huge umbrella, you know, and I, I know that there is just like any community, there's there's infighting. Uh, but for me, you know, I think for all of my work, I'm looking at kind of creating this kind of happy family where we all see the beauty in each of us. So for sure. Um, and I saw that that uh, come to Sweden note. Uh, Dell, so I'm coming. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I see. I can. I see everyone as part of the work that I do. Thanks, Lola. Um, and there's a qu uh, question from Lucy Morley Williams asking if you could perhaps share a few organisations like Autograph that promote, mentor, and champion underrepresented photographers and activists. Uh, Lucy says she's a beginner and is also looking for connections, support, inspiration, and collaborations. I mean, off the top, Ms. Renee, you might have uh, some ideas, but I mean, off the top of my head, I would say queer art. Uh, we have different kinds of programming, films, um, like I said, that they might want to apply uh, to the mentorship pro pro program next year. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different resources within the website for the queer art. So I would say for me, that would be uh, a place that I would, I would uh, suggest. And I wonder if there's anyone else in the chat that can write any of their suggestions in the chat for that young person. Yeah, good idea. Thank you. Uh, and there's, we have a question from Manuel Gallan. Uh, firstly, congratulating you and pleased to see your success in hanging in MoMA, uh, which is quite a long way from hanging in the back of Heaven nightclub. I'll perhaps leave you, <laughs> leave you to ponder that one. Um, firstly, congratulations. Uh, and Manuel says, they, they know you're modest with your accolades, but um, find so many of your important pieces of work from the LGBT community are only just now being acknowledged. Why do you think it's taken so long for that recognition to have taken place? You know, um, I think that when you look at our world, and you look at the racism and you look at the sexism and you look at the homophobia and the transphobia, all the other isms and phobias, you know, it's, uh, and then you look at someone like me, Lola Flash, who is black, queer, female, right? Um, and so, you know, I would say, um, you know, James Baldwin said he felt like he, he fit the hit the lottery, like you know, being black and queer, right? And so I feel like it's like I got the trifecta over here going on, you know. And so I think that all of those things against me actually are what has made me so strong and made it so that I had so much material to work from, you know. So I think that there's there's more of people are are, are kind of looking. I mean, I I can't blame it, I mean, not, I can't pin it all on Mr. Floyd's killing, but I think that that was a real wake up call for so many people. And, and it was so worldwide that people are like, oh, look, we've got some, some, you know, museums are like, oh, we have some, some sort of missing parts of our history. We need to, to, to fix that, you know? And so I think that that for my, for me has a lot to do with it. And I think that when you do something for 40 years, I'm just gonna own it for 40 years you know, eventually someone's going to say, hey, let's let's give this person a try, you know, and I think that it's a combination of stuff. But for me, it was just, you know, I, I've been pretty relentless and I can remember like sometimes going out my, my door, dragging all my photo equipment, thinking, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? You know what I mean? And, and then I realized now I realized, you know, this is what I've been doing it for. You know, I've been doing it to show 
how beautiful my community is, my communities are, and how just even in this conversation, sharing people's beauty, sharing my stories, you know, and hopefully it kind of will just kind of keep going, right? All of you who have listened will be like, oh, I heard Lola Flash talking about this or, you know, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a real kind of, you know, I, I hope that I kind of, when people come away from my talks, I hope they feel better about themselves because goodness knows there's not, there's still are not, there still is not enough positive representation for anyone who, you know, I'm sorry, Michael, who, anyone who's not like a white male, mm -hmm. you know, we just don't have that. And so we, we need that. We need to be able to, to wake up every morning and think I'm beautiful, you know? Okay, and we're, we're just going to ask a couple of questions, if I may just impose a little bit further on your time. Um, Anna Fox, um, Rene, actually, you sort of touched on this towards the end, but Anna's asking, um, can you tell us, do your bodies of work have beginnings and ends, or do you simply continue or revisit all of them? Well, first of all, hey, Anna. <laughs> Anna was one of my, my teachers. Oh, my. You and maybe she might have been one of the people that told me to go to see the um, the Italian painters <laughs> that made me do that. But um, anyway, can I say something just for literally one second before I'm going to forget? You know, earlier I wanted Della Grace Volcano was the reason why I moved to London and started studying at LCC. It was an exhibition in Austria. I was about sixteen or seventeen years old. And they wrote on a piece of paper, London College of Printing, check out the BA course there. And when I was 18, I moved to London and I started studying at the London College of Printing and that's where we met. So there's an, an amazing sense of serendipity here. And Anna Fox was teaching us both at LCC. So I just think it's beautiful the way everybody's also coming together here to support you in this conversation. I mean, how wonderful is that? We, yes. we, also, we also have Joy here as well, I noticed and earlier Joy on. Is here. Yeah. Who yeah. was also our tutor at college. Yes, yeah. And um, um, didn't you see that picture of, of me uh, before you met me? That, that Absolutely. Del's photograph in, of me. In Del, and I write about that in the Pen and Brush catalog. And that's, and so, so well, thank you so much for that, is really what I wanted to say. And there was a photo of you, Lola, in the purple catalog that was published. And this is like in the middle of nowhere in Austria. I mean, there's a whole long story that I could say. There was a wonderful solo show there of, of their work and the catalog. I got the catalog and in the back of the catalog was written London College of Printing, go and study there. And there was a photo of you in there. And that's what I remembered when I first saw you at LCC. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to. You, you need to answer Anna Fox's question. Yeah, Anna, I, I actually used to kind of beat myself up for not having for for no for my series not ending you know i would go to shows and think how do they know when it's finished you know um and then i just realized you know i have this global approach to my work and i really want to see everyone's you know conditions you know what i mean like racism in one place is different than sexism in another place or homophobia and other you know like so i kind of really want to get this global approach i think part of it has to do with living in london for 12 years and you know, as much as I love, you know, being from America, um, there's this kind of insular thing that happens in America, you know, like we think we're the best and we're, you know, there's just like this, whereas when you live other places, you realize that, you know, America, you know, the continent is actually smaller than most people believe. And um, there's just more, I don't know, there's just more difference, you know, like you go to Paris and there's all these different little shops and things, you know what I mean? It's not just like all these, and I, I, know, I know the gentrification, gentrification is happening everywhere. So things aren't as adorable as they used to be. Um, but anyway, the, the point is that I really just wanna see the nuances of, of various places uh, around the world. And so now that I'm retiring on the 28th of February, I'll be able to, yeah. I'm gonna be able to travel and, and you know hopefully get the funding from various grants and such to uh, to actually really delve into these projects and be able to get more representations of folks from different places. So, you know, this saying that salt is going to end when I turn seventy is kind of like the first time I've ever heard myself say something's going to end. Um, so that's going to be exciting. But uh, yeah, I, I'm curious how people know when 
a series is done. Uh, for me, I realize that it's not important. You know, the whole, I think if you look at my career, it's like a whole process, right? It's, it's just always this like ongoing. My practice is ongoing, so why shouldn't my series be ongoing? <laughs> Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you. Oh, I'm going to end with one final question that's just come in. Um, are there any contemporary artists or photographers that excite you that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, I know I wouldn't call Phoebe a photographer, but I, I'm excited to hear your your talk, uh, your upcoming talk with Phoebe um, next the, in the next couple of weeks. Mm. On the 15th. Yeah, yeah Renee. Um, so that's, that's Phoebe Boswell. Phoebe Boswell, I'm really bad with names, but there's a, a young man here called Michael, and he, I'm sorry, I don't have his last name, but he does these amazing kind of, um, it has, it, oh gosh, they're kind of inter, like they look very kind of interplanetary kind of, uh, do you know this guy? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. I'm sorry, I forget his name. Um, now, I feel like I'm like on the spot now, y'all, and I really cannot think of any person. No um, worries. I, mean, I, I love Sheila Pre Bright. I love what Sheila's doing. Mm -hmm. um, I love what, um, what's the other young lady that was at your, 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 uh, at Autograph with this, this gold? Lena Iris Victor. Y yeah, I love Lena's work. Um, yeah. You could, if you, if you hit me up on Instagram I, and I'm not sort of like feeling like a deer in headlights, I probably will come up with some more <laughs> intelligent um, answers to that question. I'm sorry if I disappointed you. No, that's great. That's perfect. Thank you. And that sort of brings us to, to the end of this conversation. So firstly, Rene, thank you so much for um, bringing out so much from Lola. And Lola, thank you again so much for, for sharing your insights into your work. And congratulations on behalf of the Royal Photographic Society for your honorary fellowship. It's, it's much deserved, probably overdue as well, but we're pleased we've, we've made that recognition. And um, thank you so much for this evening. And thank you to Joe McDonald, who's just beside me for arranging this this evening. It's been, been a wonderful event. And if you do come to the UK on your travels, please come by Autograph and to the RPS because we'd love to meet you all in person. So thank you so much. And good night every to, to our audience. Thank you for joining us this evening. We will share the chat with Lola and Rene so that they get to see your great comments. And thank you again. And the recording will be available in a few days. Okay, Good night, everyone. So much, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Renee. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Thank you.